Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, How My Old Boss Ended Up Buying the Customer a New Shed. I do tree work for a living, and the last boss I had was the kind of guy who thought he knew everything and demanded that you did things his way when he was on site. The day this story takes place was no different than any other time that boss decided to show up. We were there to drop a massive sunburst locust tree over three feet wide at the trunk and branches that spanned over 60 feet. It was a beautiful tree but the customer wanted it gone, sadly. The customer had a brand new, empty, shed on one side of his property. There was enough room to drop the tree but only if aimed just right. I set a pull rope into the tree and had my crew set our winch up on a tree along the back line of the lot to pull the locust over. My boss was not happy with my choice of felling direction and demanded in his I want to speak to your manager voice that my guys move the winch to a tree 40 feet to the right and told me that I was to aim the tree in his newly selected direction. Directly towards the shed. I told him that was a bad idea, but he wouldn't listen. He wanted to show the customer that he had absolute power over us and used one of his favorite lines, if you don't want to be here, then leave. He knew I was wearing golden handcuffs and leaving wasn't financially responsible of me with a young family at home. I accepted that he was not going to allow me or my guys to put the winch anywhere close to where it should have been and set to putting my notch into the tree. I started aiming the tree to where I knew it should have been aimed, but was again screamed at by my boss because I wasn't following his direct orders. This is where I finally gave in and aimed the tree directly towards where he wanted me to, towards she shed. My aim could not have been more true the notch and back cut were absolutely textbook. My guys applied power to the winch and we put that tree down exactly where it was aimed. The new vinyl shed. It exploded. My boss did too. The customer calmly walked out, put his hand on my shoulder, looked directly at my boss and exclaimed, Sean did exactly what you told him to. When will you be installing my new shed? I walked away from the two of them immediately as I did not need to be directly in the middle of that conversation when I knew I still needed to get the tree from the backyard and into the truck. Things then got even worse for my boss. He was the kind of boss to shout orders but not actually do anything himself. That day he decided to try to help out by taking the climbing saw, which is not set up to be used on the ground, and start hacking away at branches using only one hand on the saw very dangerous. We all knew that we would get screamed at if we said anything to him so we did our best to stay clear of the whirling dervish and do what we could at a safe distance. Five or so minutes into his arbor assault I hear him start screaming and see a chainsaw flying across the yard. Remember earlier where I said what he was doing was dangerous? The saw kicked back at him and he put his left hand up as a reaction, damn near cutting off three fingers from his left hand. We managed to get that idiot bandaged up and driven off to the hospital where the med staff were able to save the fingers that eventually had to build the customer a new shed. Edit, I no longer work for the moron. Haven't for a few years now. The next one is titled, throw away expired stuff? Stuff that doesn't have dates? All right. Back when I was in a culinary class, I could always tell my teacher didn't like me that much. She would never allow me to participate in after-school events, and would make me do dishes or other chores instead. Not what I signed up for when I took the class, but fine. You want me to learn professional skills, I get it. But your job as a teacher is to give every student the experience of learning culinary skills in a culinary class. She would also tell my brother, one of her star students, that I was annoying, and send me out on errands outside the class so she wouldn't have to see me. But anyway, one of these chores she wanted me to do was to go through the cabinets, refrigerators, and shelves to throw away anything expired. She also wanted me to throw away anything that didn't have a date on it, because, when in doubt, throw it out. So I did it. But the problem is, none of the spices on the spice rack had any labels or dates on them. And all of them had varying levels of use. I'm not a complete jerk, so I didn't throw out all the spices. I just threw out the ones that seemed to have a good amount missing. That way I knew the spices were somewhat old. I just threw out enough for my teacher to notice. 
She noticed pretty quickly, and she promptly told me to stop, to which I reminded her that I was throwing out the spices that didn't have dates on them. That pure look of annoyance and defeat was satisfying to me as she told me to sit down and that she'd have someone else do it right. So then I got to sit at the table and do nothing instead of doing chores that her golden students could do instead of smoking weed and skipping class. Maybe the reason they were staring at me throughout the ordeal was because I got a bit too close to a substance that was definitely basil. Now they had to dig through the trash to make sure I didn't get rid of any of that pretty pungent, expensive, important basil. Just kidding. I didn't know about any disguised substances on the spice rack but honestly I wouldn't be surprised. But anyway, teacher mad, students mad, but they can't punish me because I did what I was told. And then the next semester the class mysteriously disappeared from my schedule, which was very interesting to me. But I didn't care, because I wouldn't miss the days reaching down the sink as I was the only one in the class who had the courage to. I do feel bad for those kiddos I used to let sample some cookie dough if they were alone in the kitchen and vowed to tell nobody. But ironically, visiting the class revealed that after the incident, there were new spices, but they too were unlabeled. I call upon my successors to write what is wrong. If you can hear me, empty the spice racks, and look for the mythical hallucinogenic time. The next one is titled, Karen wants me to check an obvious older woman's ID. When I was in college I used to work for my local movie theater. The job was amazing most of the time. You had a lot of freedom from the managers if you did your job right. On a busy night this was the situation, I was working behind the bar. We had a system where we would sell tickets and concessions at the same registers. Most of the time this would work just fine, but one a busy Saturday night it would take a lot of time to take tickets orders, discuss seating in the theater and get all the food and drinks. On this evening everything was running smoothly. It was a buddy night, but the team was well prepared and we had everything under control. I was taking an order from a longtime customer, let's call her Linda. Linda was a nice woman and we always had a nice chat with her. She was 25 and had a subscription at our theater. This would mean it would show her picture on the app with her date of birth and a QR code. This way we could see that the person was old enough to see the movie. Linda was ordering some nachos and two beers. Now I know that Linda is well above the legal drinking age, in my county 18, and had already scanned her QR code, you would get points for free stuff when you bought drinks and foods. I already knew her age was alright. So no reason to ask for any form of ID. So I'm here getting the order ready and when I say the total to Linda a lady behind her, let's call her Karen for obvious reasons, starts yelling. Karen, you didn't check her ID. Linda looks over her shoulder, probably wondering why this woman is meddling and turn backs to me, do you really need to see my ID? I could grab it if you want to. So I'm here thinking, Karen should shut the duck up and mind her own business. Me, no, need to, Linda. I know you're older than 18 and it also says so on the app. Karen, no, you need to check it. You need to check everyone that buys alcohol. Me, miss, I already verified her age and Karen, no. Only a legal ID or passport is good to verify age. Sure, this is the case in a normal situation. But when a customer has a subscription at our theater they already have to verify their age and name with a legal ID. So we accept the app as a legal form of verification. At this point I'm already losing my patience. Why is Karen meddling in this situation when Linda is clearly over the age of 18? Me, miss, thanks for bringing this to my attention but this woman is a loyal customer and we already know her age because. Karen, no. This is unacceptable and you should check her ID. I'm really starting to get annoyed and Linda is noticing as well. Luckily Linda is a chill woman and smiles at me while grabbing her ID. Linda, here it is, all good right? Me, sorry for this and thanks for showing. It's still not necessary though, Linda, no problem at all and good luck with her, she says while smiling and giving me a wink. I finalize the purchase and get ready to enjoy serving Karen. Karen has a major attitude and the order takes ages. She doesn't like the seats and changes them a couple of times. She also demands a student discount, which we don't have on Saturdays and she is clearly older. Finale she orders her food and last but not least she orders a red wine. This triggers me instantly. 
I'm standing there with a big smile on my face like a kid in a candy store. You all see where this is going. I grab the wine and put in on the counter. Then I say with my most polite voice. Me, can I see your ID, miss? Karen, excuse me? Me, well miss, as you pointed out to me I should check everyone for ID. Karen, well I'm obviously older than 18. Sure Karen wasn't looking anywhere near 18. But she didn't hit prime Karen age either. I would say she was early 30s, but with all that plaster on her face she could pass for a 25 year old. Me, miss, the woman I asked before you was well over the age of 18. You insisted I follow the rules. I you don't have your ID with you I can't sell you the alcohol. Karen, preposterous. I demand to speak to the manager. Me, sure, I will get him. Now the manager this evening was Bob. Bob hated types like Karen and I knew he would stand by my side. So I go grab Bob and inform him of the whole situation. When I explained it all Bob smiled at me with a huge grin on his face. Bob, let's go have some fun. So Bob walks with me to the registers and Karen yelled the whole story. Bob's listens carefully and then reminds her of the rules and she needs to have some ID or she won't get her wine. Karen is done with the situation, I could clearly tell. The previews already started so she grabs her wallet and pulls out a public transport card. Karen, here you go. It states I'm old enough. Bob, sorry, miss. This isn't a legal form of ID. Karen at this point is bright red and I thought she would burst out in anger. Karen, I demand you sell me this wine. This is ridiculous and I'm about to miss the movie. Bob, nothing I can do for you without ID miss. I should also note that when the previews are over, usually after 15 minutes after starting time, we can't let you go inside the theater because this will cause a disturbance for the other visitor. At this point I wish I could have taken a picture of Karen face. The utter face of defeat was amazing to see. Karen, fine. Just keep the wine. I'm going to see the movie and then I'm never coming back here. Bob, that's a shame miss. That will be XXX please. After the whole incident I got a compliment from Bob for sticking to the rules and for defeating a Karen in her own game. The next one is titled, Old But Hilarious Story of Malicious Compliance. I'm not in IT, but in auto repair, but since cars are technology, sorta, and modern automobiles are basically poorly designed computers with barely controlled explosions powering them, kinda, I hope my stories will fit in, at least a little. A few years back, I worked for a small, questionably honest used car dealership and repair shop. I'm a service writer, which means I'm the interface between customers, who are idiots, and the technicians, who are mostly felons. Think Tom Smykowski from Office Space. I will warn you ahead of time, I am not the hero of my stories, just the protagonist. There are no heroes in the car industry, we are all villains in our own ways. Preamble. It was a typical grey rainy day in my part of the world. My horrible old Windows mobile giant brick phone lit up with the number of our computer guy who was a blatant insult to IT professionals everywhere. No one knew why he got hired nor why he managed to still be employed, given that things like Macintoshes and Linux completely baffled him. We'll call him incompetent tech guy ITG, just to avoid besmirching the term IT by associating him with it. Me, service, this is 36,055,512. ITG, how? How do we do the numbers for the cars? This was fairly typical for one of his questions. Barely a sentence, much less something with any discernible meaning. Me, I'm sorry? I'm not sure what you're asking. ITG, the numbers for the cars. Do we start with one and work our way down, or what? Me, ooh, the inventory numbers. I gotcha. No, we just take the last four of the vehicle identification number, VIN. Every car sold in the US and Canada, and most other countries as well, has a 17-digit code stamped everywhere on the car that provides details about it, make, model, engine, serial number, and so forth, that is unique to the car. At a dealership, it's really important to keep track of what car is what, so you don't get all the silver golfs mixed up, which is another story. We just used the last four digits of the VIN to keep track of who was who, and since our inventory was never more than 30 cars or so, we hadn't yet had an issue with it. 
My conversation partner hung up abruptly, which was typical for his stunted social skills, and I went back to shopping for parts for my Jeep. Just as I was about to drop a new set of off-road lights onto my Amazon wish list, an email popped into my inbox. Attention staff, from now on, inventory numbers are to be the last six numbers of the VIN, not the last four. ITG, the ITG was known for his grand proclamations that rarely were connected in any way to reality and even more rarely were actually approved by the owners. I got on the horn with one of the owners who we shall call Rom, since he so precisely matched both the demeanor and dental hygiene of the DS9 character. Rom, ITG says that the last four digits isn't good enough, that there could be duplication, and that would be a whole cluster duck. Me, well, he's not wrong, but it's like a 1 to 10,000 chance for each car, and we only ever have 30 or so cars. It's never happened, and it's going to be a mess to change every record in the computer system to all new inventory numbers. Why not leave it alone and if we have a collision, worry about it then? Rom, no. Last six. Fix it by the end of the day. Whatever. I had long since given up arguing with Rom. It never went anywhere, and I was getting to the point where I was burned out enough that the fallout from his poorly thought out decisions was beginning to be less irritating and more just plain entertaining to watch. I spent the afternoon making new key tags for all the cars and updating all our records in the database to have the new six digit inventory numbers. The next morning, my instant message lit up. It was Rom. Rom, can you give me a printout of the paperwork on number 9721? I felt my face curl into the biggest grin since the Cheshire Cat. It was time for the full idiocy of this unnecessary renumbering scheme to be truly known. Me, I need the last six of the VIN. Rom, why? I don't have the last six of the VIN, just 9721, me, well, as you'll remember, we're using the last six now. I can't look it up by the last four anymore. My phone immediately rang. I made it less than one word into my customary greeting. Serve, Rom, what the hell? Why do we need the last six of the VIN? Me, you remember yesterday when we switched over at the behest of ITG? Well, I switched over all the records like you wanted, so I gotta have all six digits to look anything up. Rom, duck. I have this paperwork from last week, and it just has the last four. How about that? There was a long pause. I started to feel a little bad for Rom. No doubt he had a customer in his office at the moment, trying to negotiate pricing, and he needed one of our patented fake inspection forms to prove that the car was a peach. I remembered the car, a fairly rare diesel Passat wagon in a lovely grey. It would have been a nice car if it weren't a Volkswagen. I could perfectly well have looked the car up by the last four, since I knew exactly what it was and there was only one diesel Passat wagon in the inventory, but after spending most of an afternoon putting ITG's stupid plan into action, I thought better of it. Rom, what am I supposed to do with this? Me, well, you could find the car and give me the last six off the VIN tag. Otherwise, we're stuck. Rom, the car's not here, it had a wobble on the test drive, so I sent it up to the alignment shop. I've got a customer about to walk, here. Me, I dunno, man. Wish I could help you, I really do. The line went dead, and I went back to pretending like I was working. An hour later, my mole in the sales department texted me to let me know the customer had walked and we had lost a big sale. She asked if I had any idea why Rom was in ITG's office and what all the shouting was about. I started to smile, but just then an email popped into my inbox. Attention staff, from now on, inventory numbers are to be the last four of the VIN, not the last six. ITG, victory. It tastes so sweet. The next one is titled, This Place Sucks. This is my friend's story and takes place in the late 1980s. Skip was from a smallish town and had ultra-religious parents. After high school, his first goal was to get out of town via college. His parents would only pay for him to attend a small private religion-based school. He was a non-believer privately, but it was a ticket out of town and his options were limited. Also, he was coming to terms with his sexuality, namely being gay. He went off to college and was horrified to discover he had even less freedom at college than he had at his parents' home. There was a very strict, early curfew and students were only allowed to engage in activities that glorified our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen. 
This included a ban on secular music, no satanic rock and roll, or R-rated movies. The students were all kept on a very short leash with spies everywhere, eager to snitch on fellow students for violations of the student code. This college made Liberty University seem like Las Vegas in comparison. Violations resulted in being confined to campus with penalties incrementally increasing in severity. In addition to mandatory church, Bible class-related activities, students were required to complete campus service. Among the ways to do service was give campus tours to prospective students. Here's where malicious compliance comes into play. Skip decided to give his tours with a dose of reality. He would follow the script given to tour guides then take prospective students aside and tell them things like, you don't want to go here, it sucks, or they treat you like children, curfew is at 9 and you have no freedom. And other bits of information to sabotage their enrollment. Most students were grateful for this intel and thanked him. His scheme worked until sometime in his sophomore year when someone ratted him out. He left the college, moved to South Beach and became a go-go boy and personal trainer. He was working and attending community college when I met him. I lost track of him but he seemed really happy living the life he chose. Can I get an Amen? The last one is titled, Giving me detention unless I come in with appropriate footwear? Well, okay. So, a little important background on me and the teacher in question. Starting with myself, I grew up in a very poor family of five with my mother and three siblings. I was the textbook case for Asperger's at the time but was not yet diagnosed as the psychologist who had conducted the original diagnosis had taken a dislike to me because I had told him his joke, the one about the inflatable boy in the inflatable school, real amateur stuff even to an eight-year-old, was stupid, which meant that I was simply not a very nice little boy, rather than autistic. The teacher, who we will henceforth refer to as Mr. Wiggles after a particularly torturous punishment he loved to dole out during detentions, was an amazing and crazy man, stern to those who lacked discipline but even-handed and genuinely attentive to the needs of every student, as well as having a mean streak almost as large as his deliciously evil sense of humor. Cut to me, 13 years old, in my first year of high school, Brit boy over here, and desperately autistic, completely without understanding of the common social graces such as sarcasm. I go into school one day with my only good remaining pair of shoes, white trainers with velcro straps, nothing fancy or brand named, and Mr. Wiggles is having none of it. Op, what do you think you're wearing on your feet? Shoes. Very funny. Tomorrow, either come in wearing black shoes per the dress code or don't come in at all. Paint them if you have to, well, okay then. At the time I had never intentionally missed a day of school, if I could avoid it. I would do so as I was convinced the only way to get out of grinding poverty was to grow up with perfect grades so I could get into the upper echelons, sweet naive child that I was. I hatched a plan. The week before, my mum had thought it would be great for a house full of children who enjoyed scribbling on everything in sight to have a wall that it was actually okay for us to draw on, so she went out and bought some chalkboard paint. This stuff basically turns any surface into a functioning chalkboard and is great fun for kids and adults too I've found, I really recommend it. At this point though, I had another purpose for it. As I said, we were poor. There was no way my mum could afford to pay for a new pair of school shoes for me this month so I decided, with not a hint of malice in my heart, not so much malicious compliance as autistic compliance, that dipping my shoes in this stuff would fulfill the only condition laid out by my teacher to a satisfactory degree. Next day. I crinkle into class with my brand spanking new, chalkboard shoes, patent pending, crunching underfoot, sounding for all the world like I had managed to fit maracas between each of my toes. Mr. Wiggles asks me what on earth I was wearing, having already forgotten about the incident the day before since he didn't hold things against his students unless they were serious. I told him exactly what I had done and each logical step in the train of thought that had led me to this point. He laughs his absolute butt off, a very pleasant sound since this man was known to have an amazing sense of humor between the students and staff, and congratulates me on my innovative solution, gesturing to take a seat. After that period Mr. Wiggles pulled me aside and explained that he'd rather I come in wearing inappropriate footwear than destroy a perfectly serviceable pair of shoes. 
Just to explain the name, this man was very well known for his inventive detentions. A very memorable one for me was writing out Lewis Carroll's The Jabberwock 30 times during my lunch in order to try to teach me to improve my handwriting. Turned out later that I was dyspraxia and no amount of practice was fixing that though I do appreciate knowing the whole poem by heart. The Wiggles part is from his favorite form of student torture. During detentions he would have us call out random numbers from something like 1 to 500, each number representing a song from the vast playlist he had of the Australian children's television performers, the Wiggles. To this day the words, fruit salad, yummy yummy, haunt my dreams. If this man wasn't such an amazing teacher I'd say he missed his true calling as a torturer. Thanks for listening.